Questions or comments? Okay, you were first. One, two. Um, my comment is uh, about the term sustainable intensification. I, I found your definition um, less offensive than I expected. Um, <laughs> but I still don't believe it. Um, I, I don't think that you can take, just take two words, stick them together and, and then decide what they mean. Uh, I, think, I think words have, have meanings originally. And the problem with the term uh, sustainable intensification is it's rather similar to the term sustainable growth. And we know full well that you can't have sustainable growth in a finite word, world, you, you can't have year on year on growth. Um, so why can you have year on year intensification? I think that the term sort of betrays the same uh, attitude, the same thinking uh, as, as the sustainable growth. So I think it, I, I think it, it, it betrays a, an existing paradigm and in order to move forward, we need to actually uh, change a way of thinking. And I'm, uh, I'm not a certified grower, I'm a small scale grower, and I'm surrounded by conventional farmers. So, you know, conventional, I'm probably more familiar with conventional farming than, than, than some here. And the big problem in, in conventional farming is not uh, sustainable intensification, it's sustaining present levels of intensity. Um, because they haven't been making progress for the last few years, uh, they've been going backwards uh, in, in terms of their yields, uh, in terms of their environmental performance. Uh, all of these things. So I think um, I, I, I decided I don't like the term whatsoever, um, and that uh, I think we need to, uh, to, 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 to really make that point, that it does betray an existing paradigm which isn't working, and that uh, we need a better term to describe okay. what we're about. OK. Um, Nadia, do you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more with you. It's an oxymoron, actually. Uh, but this is the FAO definition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the thing is, the thing is that you can. Um, what they mean by that is that you don't you don't need more land and you need less water and less uh, less energy. Now, at what cost? It's definitely not ecological. I mean, some people sustain even within my circles that GMOs contribute to biodiversity because we're putting you're putting new biodiversity on. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so if we really come back to the words, yes, they do play with the words. And definitely, it does not mean ecological intensification. It's intensifying, but it's at the end of the day, they want to produce. And within their own equation of the input and outputs, they assume it's much more efficient. And, and it is indeed. If you put in a bigger framework, then you see that there are problems with it. Yeah. OK. David. Yeah, I just, just briefly, I think that one of the things we all struggle with is what's the right term? Because if we find a term that seems really good, we can rest assured that those who don't do what we think that means will start using it as well. And so one of the ways that we've talked about it in the Sustainable Organic Agriculture Action Network that we have formed is we use the term sustainable development. And people still have problems with that as well, but the reality is with a growing population and with a, a hungry, underdeveloped world, there is development going on. And so what is the best way to do that? We gave up the term as much as we can of actual sustainability because Nobody is yet. And, and sustainability, it's, you know, we, we were first writing about it, we said sustainability is a dynamic state. And so we said, no, that's an oxymoron. That's a contradiction, right? Because it's dynamic. We'll, we'll never actually attain sustainability. We'll continue to evolve because the world is continuing to evolve. Have I told you anybody about the definition of sustainability that I heard the other day? Sustainability is like teenage sex. Everybody claims they're doing it, but no, no one is, or hardly anyone is, and the ones who are are not doing it properly. <laughs> Tolly. Qu question for Nadia. Um, the work you've done within FAO clearly show that um, organic production is viable for feeding the world with modification of diet, obviously. But agriculture goes beyond just food. There are other products as well, particularly uh, fiber, fuel, particularly so. Um, has that study also considered the impact of fuel? Because I've been to many parts of the world where I find nearly all the population are using firewood, often to the detriment of the local forest or ecosystem. Does the survey include the production of particularly fuel to feed 
people who are cooking. I mean, some people are not able to cook because they don't have access to fuel. When you do such modeling, this one took one year only for the data to, to put it right. You always have a challenge in terms of data availability. And the data for the biofuel and the fuel was very difficult to, um, to get. So we didn't have it in the first phase. We're aiming to have it in the second phase of the SOL-M model. So we don't have the fuel yet. But we do have, we do have all use of crops you know, for textiles and non-food, yes. But there is still you know, a huge impact of particularly fuel, which hasn't been put into that equation, is that right? Well, it's a question of utilization. Huh? Um, and in the uh, statistics, you know, s under other utilization, you, you have fuel under that, but it's not distinguished. And we do have a problem within, with, in terms of data availability to do anything meaningful. Because for us, it's very important that this modeling is very robust. Okay, Martin next. Yeah, I've got you and I've got Peter, but Martin first. Um, uh, could, could somebody say a bit more about the extra land use that's deemed to be required for organic production? Um, I, I, I'm not, I feel a bit silly, really, because when you were just answering the very first question, I think you, you, you almost alluded to it, but I didn't quite hear you because I was looking at Lawrence to, to, to ask this question. But, so if you did, God help, I'll go. Uh, but but it's, it's like, um, I question it because in terms of, in, in, in agroecological approaches to food production, we are actually working alongside nature, so we're not actually uh, we, we're not degrading it. I, I can't remember what the word was you used. And so actually, and in some cases, we can be actually repairing uh, already damaged, um, degraded areas that have been happened from the present system. So have, have those kind of thinking being factored into that, um, those calculations? Mm -hmm. uh, when we looked at the organic systems, we had to, we had to fix the model in order to do the modeling. And it's more or less about two animal units per hectare. So you're really extensifying as compared to the intensive production that's going on today with livestock production. So you definitely need more land if it was to, do, to become organic along the organic standard if you are using concentrate feed, because you need land also for using concentrate, for, for producing concentrate feed. However, if you did not produce concentrate feed and use those land for more integrated systems and for other uses, then you don't need that extra land. So that was what I was trying to say. Yes, yeah, sure, sorry. Um, so uh, just to be a little um, hyperbolic, the, the uh, you know, the end of the world is an old subject, right? Everybody thinks it's going to happen and tries to predict it, but we never actually know, you know, when it happens, we pr it probably won't go down exactly like we think. And so t to answer your question, though, I think that uh, the, the modeling that, that FAO and that Nadia is talking about, I, th is that I think that really has something worth considering. But I also think that as we change and as we think about the paradigm that we're trying to change and our method of production, that goes also for our own organic practices. Because a lot, as, as it's been talked about during this conference, some organic practices, practices are still done somewhat with a conventional mindset. And the, the increased diversification of agriculture and a change in our diets as well, I think will moderate this question of how much la extra land needs to be broken for actual agricultural production. The way we start to rethink how agriculture happens on a farm, its own diversity of products, and what it's feeding to the markets and what people are used to is going to change over time. And we can envision that, but my sense is that things like energy scarcity and rising costs of certain kinds of crops is going to force change on us from without, in a sense. You know, one of the big, uh, one of the big articles in Newsweek, a major kind of mainstream publication in the United States, was what are we going to do when we can't eat pasta anymore? Peter, melt it. Thank you, and Nadia and David, it's really interesting presentations. Um, and Nadia, I look forward to seeing the published versions of the uh, modeling you're doing, which is fascinating and pretty important. Uh, my comment was that both of you mentioned the, the need to, for us to change our diets. Um, and I think, David, you said we're not sure how we're going to achieve that. The Soil Association has been 
uh, trying to do some work on that. We, we've got a program now, Food for Life, which is involved with about 20% of the schools in England and has a big program in Scotland and uh, with catered food in restaurants and so on, about 600, getting off 650, thousand meals a day now served in this country where we're trying particularly to look at um, better quality and less meat which and dairy products which both of you mentioned and I guess the one of the things it seems to me I don't think either of you mentioned that we need to do uh, nationally and globally is to work with public health authorities because the, our diet needs to change not just for the reasons both of you outlined quite rightly, but also because we're killing ourselves from overeating in most countries of the world now, including places like China and India, and public health professionals want that to stop quite reasonably. It's a huge cost to health services, and that's a, those are really strong allies for us in this changing diet so that we can feed the world organically. Thank you. And um, just here? Thank you, my name is Nigel Baker. Um, actually, it's, it's very much in the last two points. Um, following on, on those two points, the problem with the, the data which uh, you've had to present, I, I, I think, it fundamentally is the wrong baseline, Com the completely wrong baseline, because it, it's presumably it's based on the mass switch to Western diet. And if you follow that baseline, it isn't going to work. So the big problem there is, we start in completely the wrong place. We should be starting in a, a different place, and that should take into account the point about healthy, uh, you know, a, a healthy, nutrition-rich diet, not a calorie-rich diet, which our food system is based on. Uh, and, and just also the issue was worrying me about land. Uh, we we all know that agroecology is the most efficient use of land. Uh, every study in the world tells us that, mainly because of, of high labour input, but it is the most efficient. Um, so it's a bit of a worry that the, the word's going to get out that actually for people who are really into the uh, um, wildlife issues and things like that, and thinking, oh my God, organics means more land. That's a very dangerous uh, message to go out because it's completely wrong. Uh, and, the, and the last thing, sorry, is about greenhouse gases. Uh, because if we follow that diet plan, we, we're completely buggered anyway because of the greenhouse gases from all the methane. So that's just a nonsense, not, not your fault, I don't know. It's just a nonsense scenario, and we need to be shouting that loud and clearly and starting off with a sensible baseline. David? Um, yeah, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of diet, I think that we have to um, think about, well, you know, the global economy as we know it is not sustainable. Until there's a cheap, renewable, clean way to move all this stuff around, it's not going to be, and technology may save us. You know, maybe someone will really figure out how to make hydrogen out of water and we'll be able to do it, but it, that's not on the horizon yet. And, and so what I think that means in the long term is that we're going to have to eat more locally. And in a sense, that could be a very good thing. It may be a hard thing for people to swallow, if you'll excuse the pun, but, uh, the, but it may be good because food is the center of culture just about anywhere you go. And the countries that are, I would say, that is the most devoid of that culture is my own, where no, you know, no population is probably more divorced from its food supply in the United States, and it, is, it causes a pervasive cultural problem. But you know, in, on our, in our core group of people who have written this best practice reference is an Argentinian. And we've talked, oh, people can't eat so much meat. Well, try to tell that to an Argentinian. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't think the Argentines are going to want to give up their meat. And quite frankly, maybe they don't have to if they really have a local, more sustainable food system. What you eat here versus what somebody in Ethiopia or China or India or Argentina eats does not have to be the same and can have a very different protein, carbohydrate, whatever profile based on climate, based on cultural mores, and based on what is actually producible there. I don't think the baseline is wrong. <laughs> uh, it's just, you know, if you were a policymaker, and this is the demand you have from your nation, and you're faced with that, how am I going to meet it? And you have to rely on certain number of resources, land, water, energy, and so forth, 
This is the kind of calculation you come up with if, of course, the diet was the way it is now, which is wrong. Mm -hmm. So the conclusion of this is that the way this is going, if the demand from mainly, it's not from northern countries, really, the meat demand, the 85%, it's really coming from developing countries now where you have a middle class that, is, that can afford having the same kind of meat consumption as us. We cannot say you cannot do it the same way as we did it. I mean, they have the right to do it. And if you look at, the, at, that, at those billion people having this type of diet, then we do have a problem. So what we're saying is that continue the way we are doing and providing the food for 9.1, 9.2 billion people with the same trend as today <laughs> would mean that we would need so much more land if it was to be organic. However, if we change diet to have an average calories of more than, uh, there's different discussions, of course, on the pros of corn, but more than 3,000 uh, kilocalories per person, which is more than enough, then we could feed the people, but the, the distinction between whether your protein is coming from animals and plant is changed, and you have it on the graph also. You have a different proportion. So it does entail a different diet, definitely. And that's what the model is saying. What about the greenhouse gases? Well, on the, on the global greenhouse uh, warming potential, organic is, is faring much, much better. Okay. It's, it's less, less greenhouse gases. So it's improving in terms of nitrogen surplus, uh, phosphorus p uh, surplus, in terms of energy use, definitely, and in, in greenhouse gas emissions. It's improving all those indicators. The only one which, if we had to continue the same trend, which is negative, which appears negative, was the trend of today of consumption, projected 2050, of course, is the land because of the concentrate use. There was, yeah, you've got. Okay. Um, good evening. I have two questions. The first one to Mr. David. Maybe I missed, uh, I missed something, but I, I'd like to know, uh, talking about the best practices, at which extent, in your opinion, these best practices can be defined globally, or at which extent they must be defined locally? Talking about your example on Argentina, and also at which scale they must eventually be defined locally. And um, another question to Mrs. Shalaba. And, um, you, told, you mentioned before some people, and I know a lot of uh, thinking that uh, a new GMO is uh, enhancing biodiversity because it's a new species. And um, don't you think that uh, we we'll really lack some clear definition of biodiversity at a policy level? And uh, how do you think it's important to have one to build up a definition of biodiversity that can prevent uh, this uh, way of thinking to be dominant one day? Thank you. Okay, so David, um, best practice, local and yeah. uh, appropriate scale. Right. When we, we try to define best practice, we look at the full scope of issues that we think are out there on the table. And one of the uh, one of the one of iPhone's efforts in general is to try and find equivalence in the world between systems because different mindsets and and uh, and regions or geographical regions have their own particular outlook on things and and that diversity is good we don't all need to think the same but we do want to make sure that we are covering a unified set that is complete enough and so the way we've depicted it now as i did on the on the in the slides here is our current conception of that. As I said, at the end of this month, actually, we will release this for public consultation to try and get feedback on that. Does everybody have to use exactly that set? No. But just like not everybody has to use the same organic standard, but what we try to do is evaluate different systems for equivalence to each other. Do they actually cover it? When, when we started looking at this best practice reference, we thought we would include in it a set of metrics and indicators. What we realize is that there's a lot of sets out there, and they're actually all, a lot of them are really pretty good. And they cover similar things, but you know, they, they can start to converge in common ground, but we don't want to rob people of their own specific things that they think are important. So uh, it happens on, on two levels. We have a common set, but then it is allowed to filter out into a different, uh, uh, different, slightly different ways of expressing it, as long as they actually cover these sets. You know, one of the things that they say is, you know, when you try to create a document like this and you do it with a bunch of people, everybody is like a dog. They all have to go and pee on it themselves and right? put their mark on it. And the reality is, is that we can come up with a good set that we all agree on and then, and then realize 
that there are going to be slightly different translations of that. And as long as we can say that somebody's not using it as a greenwash, you know, that they're completely ignoring a certain dimension, for instance, then we can say that, that they're actually doing what we want them to do. And Nadia, on uh, biodiversity definitions or um, dealing with GMOs, I think, if I understood the question. Well, that was provocative, really. I mean, uh, I, would ask the, uh, <laughs> I would ask the industry that defines uh, GMOs as being new biodiversity, whether they are God and creating biodiversity. I mean, it just makes me smile, frankly. I mean, I wouldn't spend too much time on such definitions. <laughs> Okay, I, um, I have been charged with summing up and drawing conclusions and